All right, let's spend some time talking about bond line structures or skeletal line structures. Every book and every author has a slightly different way of discussing this, and really all it is is a way for us to turn Lewis structures, and you can see how long it takes me to draw this Lewis structure, which is one reason I really don't like them that much. Bond line structures allow us to quickly draw Lewis structures, or molecules I should say, in a very simple uh, and, after a little bit of practice, easy to understand framework. So I just drew propane. It has three carbons in it. And over here I also have propane. And it is represented by this sort of upward facing arrow, if you will. And these three green arrows now all show carbons. So the bond line structure has a carbon at the end of any line, right here. And at the intersection of any two or three or four lines is a carbon. So if I were to modify my structure of propane here and put a CH3 right there, now this is not propane, or I'm sorry, this is not, uh, it's not propane anymore. It is what we call isobutane. Don't worry about too much about the name, but this is how we draw the structure. And so right here, shows the intersection of three lines. This is a carbon. And you'll notice that we don't draw any hydrogens that are attached to carbons on these skeletal line structures. It is up to you, the viewer, to fill in the missing hydrogens. And to do that, we need to remember one simple rule. Carbon always wants four bonds. So in this carbon that I've drawn here, there is one hydrogen attached to it. It is not drawn in. That makes the drawing a lot simpler. Uh, it is up to you to mentally fill in the one hydrogen. How many hydrogens are attached to the carbon at the end of this line? We already have one bond showing. So this is a C with three H's. Sometimes we'll just add the CH3 at the end of the line. That's fine. Uh, but we will rarely add this hydrogen unless we're talking about reactions of that hydrogen or at that position. So I'm going to get rid of that. What if we have a double bond in our molecule? I could draw this Lewis structure of propene, ene meaning I have a double bond between two carbons. And I can translate that into that line drawing. Here, we use two lines in parallel to indicate the double bond. And this is considered to be an intersection of two lines, the double bond from the left and the single bond from the right. And if we were to mentally fill in the hydrogens, hopefully you'll tell me there's one H right there. It's a very poor one. There's one H at this intersection, and there are two H's here. I don't want to draw those in. I just want to discuss them. So. This is also considered the end of a line. In this case, it's a double bond line. And so there are two H's coming off of that carbon, right? These two H's right here. So with practice, you will be able to quickly translate these skeletal structures into uh, the more complex, um, I won't say more useful, because I don't actually find them very useful, but the more complex Lewis structures. What if we have a heteroatom attached to one of our carbons. Let's draw this Lewis structure of acetone. So this is acetone, and there's a double bond between the middle C and the O. And we can translate that into a skeletal line structure like this. And if you want to draw lone pairs, that's fine. Lone pairs are actually optional on skeletal line structures. Heteroatoms, like the O, are not. Sorry, heteroatoms must be drawn. So you cannot leave out the O. Um, so ask yourself this question. How many hydrogens are attached to this carbon in the middle? Hopefully you see a single bond, a single bond, and a double bond attached to that carbon. So we'll say there are zero hydrogens attached to that carbon. 
And indeed, on our Lewis structure, you can see that that is indeed the case. What happens when we have a hydrogen attached to a heteroatom, such as in ethanol? Remember, we have to draw all heteroatoms, so there's my oxygen. And the rules state also that we have to draw all hydrogens attached to non-carbons. So if the hydrogen is attached to anything but a carbon, it must be drawn. So we have to draw this. We cannot just draw this. That is not acceptable. And we'll get to sort of why that is in a few minutes. So we can leave out lone pairs if we want to. I, I encourage you to include them because that will make reactions easier. We must draw all hydrogens that are not attached to carbon. So this is a proper Lewis structure of ethanol. This is also a proper Lewis structure of ethanol. Sometimes we leave out the OH bond, probably just out of sheer laziness. Uh, but this is a fine um, drawing as well. There's nothing wrong with this one. So what is the, uh, the use of these skeletal line structures? Well, not only are they quicker to draw, I hope I've convinced you of that over the past few minutes, but also they make it easier to identify functional groups, right? It is obvious on ethanol that the OH is different from the rest of the molecule, especially when I have just these lines over here. Uh, and if I go back to acetone, if I look at this Lewis structure, it's not as obvious that there is a, let's circle that in a different color here, it's not as obvious that we have this CO double bond. But in this drawing of acetone, it is very obvious that there is a functional group here. And that's a good thing because, as you will learn in organic chemistry, the, uh, the functional group is often where the action happens. That's where all the reactivity will take place. So that CO double bond that I've circled in red defines the reactivity of acetone. And if we can't pick that out quickly and quickly understand, hey, there's a ketone or a CO double bond present here, um, it, it's not going to be very helpful to us. And so that's why it's a much more useful uh, drawing is the skeletal line structure. So you should be able to um, pick out all the different carbons and oxygens and everything here. Um, so, for instance, if we had this structure, you should be able to quickly come up with a chemical formula just for practice. We won't often do this, but it's good practice uh, when we're first learning this so that we can uh, make sure we don't miss any carbons or hydrogens when we're, we're counting up C's and H's. <coughs> so go ahead and uh, try to get an accurate chemical formula of the drawing I just made here. Okay, so the first thing that I do is to basically write out some generic formula. And we're going to fill in the subscripts here. So how many carbons? Well, if we count around the ring starting here, one, two, three, four, five, six, those are six carbons. Remember that these are all intersections of lines. They count as carbons. This is a seventh carbon right here. That is also a carbon, so it's C7. How many hydrogens do I have? Let's erase these green numbers. They'll get confusing. Remember that hydrogens are filled in on carbons according to how many more bonds they need. So if I look at this carbon here, it has two bonds to it, left and right. It needs two more to get to four, so it has two hydrogens. Same thing with most of the rest of these in the ring. And we can do this for practice, but we're not often going to spend our time taking skeletal line structures and basically turning them into Lewis structures. But, but here it's just, I'm using it, this technique just to show you how many hydrogens there are. I put one hydrogen on this carbon because it already had three bonds. And I put two more here. So if I want to count up hydrogens, I have uh, basically 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And that's how many hydrogens I have in this molecule. There's one O and one N, so we could leave out those ones. But that's how we might think about a skeletal structure and turning it into a uh, just a chemical formula. And that that's basically the only reason we do that is to practice identifying quickly the number of hydrogens attached to uh, certain carbons. Another useful uh, point about skeletal line structures is that they can often help us understand exactly what happened during the course of a reaction um, without too much effort. So let's look at this potential reaction, which we'll learn about in Chapter 9. 
specifics are not important here. But I hope that you can recognize that there was an alkene in the starting material, and now there is no alkene present. And that's very easy to see using these skeletal line structures. If I had drawn Lewis structures, expanded structures with C's and H's all over the place, it would be very difficult to see that double bond and watch it disappear. Uh, another example might be this reaction, where I turn the CO double bond into a CO single bond. That's pretty easy to see uh, in these skeletal line structures. Another reaction would be to take the CO double bond and remove it completely, and that's very obvious uh, using these skeletal line structures. So I will direct your attention to Table 2.1, and that lists all the important functional groups that we're going to discuss this semester and potentially in Organic 2. Uh, so I'll encourage you to, dare I say it, memorize that table, uh, and that will allow you to understand this is a ketone, this is an alcohol, this is an alkene, and this is an alkane. And it's very important that we begin to start to speak the language of organic chemistry so that it, we can uh, get down to uh, the more interesting things. Right? We don't want to spend our time trying to convince everyone that this is an alkane. Uh, it's not worth our time to do that. We want to spend time on reactivity and, and other concepts like that. So Table 2.1 uh, should be the, uh, a main focus during your time spent on Chapter 2.